So today I'm going to be re reviewing Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. I could have made two videos for this, a review, and it doesn't make sense, but honestly, it's just not worth that kind of time. And also I've been filming for two hours for my Snape video, so we're just gonna chat about this for a little while. My overall thoughts are this was a, I know it's a screenplay, and I'm really fine with the formatting of screenplay. Doesn't bother me at all. It's just that this was this was terrible. Um, so if you want my spoiler-free thoughts, there they are. It was awful, and I do not recommend it. I'm just gonna be really upfront with you now. This is going to be a rant review. I'm just gonna be talking about all the reasons I think this book was terrible. I gave it one star. Scorpius was an awesome character, and I really liked him, and that's the only thing I liked about the book, so. We're just gonna talk about all the reasons I think that this screenplay failed. So this screenplay, this script, kicks off really well with them basically rehashing the epilogue. It's sentimental, it's sweet, it's a little bit inaccurate, but whatever. The reason I say it kicks off well is because in that very first scene, they already leave their daughter behind. I think it's hilarious that Lily says, I'm gonna go chase the train. And they say, okay, just come right back. And then she runs off to chase the train. And then they have a little discussion and then they're like, okay, let's leave now. And then it talks about the adults leaving and not Lily. They left her behind or the writers already forgot that these characters have other children because they don't really write about them. They, Albus has siblings, but we, we don't really see him, or at least hardly at all. Definitely not the appropriate amount. Anyway, getting into the meat of the book, really, I think one of the worst things about it was that these characters digressed so much. So this whole play, this whole play is, is really banking on our nostalgia. The problem is the characters that they bring back are worse versions of their old selves. Harry, who in the face of abuse grew to be this incredible character, is now horrible. He tells his son he wishes that he weren't actually his son, which I don't buy. Then he keeps his son from his one and only friend by bullying and threatening McGonagall to stalk the children with the Marauder's Mac map and keep them apart. We'll get to that later. But Harry's character, horrible. Nothing like the Harry that we grew up with. Hermione I don't have much issue with in the first timeline, though I super don't like that in the second timeline when she's removed from Ron, when she and Ron aren't don't end up together, she turns into Snape. She becomes this cruel, mean teacher who's bitter and just horrible, which is just, just great. Love that about Hermione. Ron is basically just one of the twins. He, he kind of slides into the role of Fred, except a worse version of Fred. He runs the joke shop and he's always making bad jokes and he can't even get through a sentence without like, five hyphens or m dashes the man can hardly speak he's not funny but he tries really hard to be and he just comes off as overall very odd and insecure not the ron we know and love at all moaning myrtle also isn't herself uh, she now makes death jokes whereas she used to be offended at just the mention of death cedric diggory who was one of the most selfless people that we saw in the entire series who was constantly making really big choices for the sake of fairness, including when he won a really intense Quidditch match and then he found out that he the only reason he won was because the Dementors came after Harry. He tried to call off the win. He tried to give it back and ask for a rematch because he only wanted to win fairly, as well as telling people to stop wearing their Potter Stinks badges and helping Harry in the tournament after Harry helped him. He just, he doesn't come off as the type who would, after one humiliating moment in his life, suddenly he's evil. He's a Death Eater. He kills Neville because he was embarrassed once. I don't buy it. McGonagall, who is for some reason still teaching, is easily pushed around by Harry when he tries to have her stalk her students and keep them apart. And I don't buy it. McGonagall is such a strong character. And then you have Snape which I just reject wholly in this book. I, I spend so freaking much time analyzing this character and creating a whole video about him, which I'll link in, in the corner. And this book takes all the nuance away from him. He looks a little bit mean when we first see him, but then as soon as he realizes he can trust you, actually he's working actively for the rebel group. He's joking around with them. And he even says that he's proud that Albus has his name. 
I reject this Snape. This is this, this is from someone who doesn't want Snape to have any kind of nuance in him. Plus, Teddy isn't even in the book. And he was halfway raised by Harry. George is also not in the book, which I just find like, wh what if you're gonna turn Ron into Fred, at least have George around. Anyway, let's go into the scenes. So we have the scene with the trolley witch, which has gotta be one of the worst scenes in the book, honestly. Not only is she just nonsensical, she's this creature with spikes for hands and her spikes are spiky. Her candy turns into bombs. She lives on this train and she makes sure that the students never get off. She says that many students have tried, specifically ones that we know about and know others, and she's never let anyone get off before they've reached their destination. So Albus and Severus get out of the situation quite easily by jumping. Too bad no one else has thought of that. So Delphi stole ingredients for the Polyjuice Potion a while ago. Mon McGonagall mentions it. She made Polyjuice Potion. The kids come to Delphi. Delphi gives them the Polyjuice Potion. They all somehow have hairs uh, on them for the people that they're trying to change into. I don't know why they're carrying around these hairs. It's fine. Everything's fine. And they easily get into the ministry and get into Hermione's office, which apparently Alohomora can, off can open the Minister of Magic's office door. There's like no security whatsoever. And these kids just really easily get there. Then they find the time turner. So the scene with the bookshelf is odd. I don't know why Hermione decided to hide the time turner there. Probably just because it would look cool in a play and not because of any actual reasons. It's a weird scene. I didn't really care for it. And just in general, okay, let's talk about the time turner. The time turner I have issue with for a lot of reasons. First of all, will you guys, if you, know my channel, you know I'm not a fan of time travel anyway. I didn't like it in the third book. I don't like it in this book. I really don't like it in this book for a couple of reasons. One, JK Rowling introduced this this thing into her plot for one book. And then after she did it, after she had it in one book, she never put it in another book. Why? Because she realized that it was an element to her world that expanded it to the point that she couldn't move in her world anymore. What she wanted to accomplish with this story couldn't be accomplished with the existence of time turners. So she destroyed them all. But then when these fellows wanted to write a screenplay, she for some reason gave the green light to bring them back. But the way they were brought back doesn't work with this world at all. First of all, in book three, it was a closed loop time travel, which I'm still not a fan of, but whatever. This time travel is not that. They can actually affect time. If they change anything, then it, it creates a separate timeline rather than everything has to happen in a certain way because it's already happened. I actually prefer this form of time travel over book three time travel. I don't really like the closed loop. I like when changing things creates new timelines, but the execution was the, with this was horrible. And we'll get into all the reasons why it didn't work as we're going through the scenes. But the other issue I have with the time turners is how they're treated. So time turners aren't this big evil thing throughout the original series. Time turners are things that people use regularly and that they even give to children just so they can have, well, one child. Granted, Hermione was the exception, the exception to the rule, but gave to a child so that she could have a couple extra courses in her schooling. These were not big, dangerous things. And yet all throughout the Cursed Child, the Time Turner as, is treated as this horrible device that everyone decided on, everyone decided together, we should never have these again, instead of them accidentally getting destroyed in the Department of Ministries. When McGonagall finds out that Hermione had one, she says, shame on you, you shouldn't have kept this. When they get the opportunity to use it, people like Harry treat it as if it's this horrible thing and they would never use it unless they absolutely had to. Everybody in this world treats this as if this horrible, dangerous device that should never have existed and that we shouldn't have any more of. So I guess the entire wizarding world has changed their perspective on time turners in this time. Oh yeah, also when the kids are in the ministry, one of the kids keeps kissing his aunt, which is super unnecessary and incredibly weird. And also he says a lot of weird, random, unnecessary things like, we should have a baby. And do Hermione and Ron just not talk? Do they never communicate? Because I feel like this conversation would come up again when she sees Ron later. Now let's get into the actual time travel. So the kids get to the forest, to the end of the forest, and they're gonna go back in time. Turns out that it's only a five minute time or they only have five minutes to do it because that would make it more cinematic. And the kids decide they need to be wearing Durmstrang robes. And the reason they decide this is because 
Hogwarts students would expect to recognize these kids if they're in Hogwarts robes. So it makes sense that they would be Durmstrang students to not, to not raise any suspicions, which one, Hogwarts is a big enough school that not every student knows every single student. Two, Durmstrang only brought a handful of their students. So I feel like Durmstrang seeing some random kids wearing their robes would be way more suspicious. And three, these kids are, I think only 14 at the point of this book. So they're not even old enough to be Durmstrang students. The Durmstrang school only brought over 17 year olds because they only brought the ones that could compete in the competition. The rest of Durmstrang is back there. So why do we have 14 year olds running around in Durmstrang robes? And oh, it's fine. Everybody's fine with it. Then we get to the actual time travel. So when they disrupt the first task and they come back and the timeline has changed. And a lot of things are still the same, but also some major things are different. But everybody has forgotten the first timeline, right? Nobody knows that Albus was once a Slytherin. He's now a Gryffindor. Nobody knows that Ron and Hermione used to be married. Ron's married to Padma Patel. Everything's different except the main emotional conflict. Harry told Albus that he wishes he weren't his son. That still exists in the second timeline because reasons. Also, Harry still remembers the thing that Bane told him in the forest right before time changed and actively is trying to separate the boys because of this thing that Bane told him. Because reasons. Harry shouldn't remember that thing because that was in the first time timeline that changed. Harry shouldn't have still said that thing because that was in the first timeline that changed. Everybody's forgotten everything except for these central conflicts that are conveniently remembered. Also, everyone forgot about the first timeline. No one remembers anything from the first timeline except for the boys who went back in time and also apparently Delphi who did not go back in time with them, but she remembers the first timeline because reasons. Then we have the scene where Harry threatens McGonagall and tells her, you have to pour over this map and watch my kid at all times and make sure that he stays apart from this other kid as if that's all McGonagall has to do. And then Harry even threatens her to get her to do it, which is just horrible. They even mention that Harry really hasn't changed with the second timeline. He's basically the same person. So this is just Harry. This is just who he's become. Oh, and then also, like I mentioned before, Hermione is horrible in this timeline because she didn't marry Ron. Also, I don't like that in this timeline, apparently Harry, Ron, and Hermione really aren't tight anymore. Apparently after the Battle of Hogwarts, they like stopped being close and barely talk anymore. Ron calls Hermione Professor Granger and they're super awkward together because reasons. So then we have our second try to, ta ta to change time. We're gonna go back and try to affect the second task. How are we gonna do it? We're gonna chat up Myrtle a little bit and then slide down a sink. This is not explained and it doesn't make any sense. We know that the chamber to the Chamber of Secrets opens up the sinks and opens up into this wide tunnel that you can slide down. This is acceptable, but this single sink that dumps into the lake, which, what? This single sink that dumps into the lake, they somehow climb down and slide through. How is this a thing? Is this one sink that randomly and conveniently dumps into the lake, the lake also? Does that also open up into a giant, a giant pipe that a human can fit through? It's not explained at all how they get through this sink or why the sink is designed differently. I'm pretty sure there isn't some sinister plot that somebody did this intentionally. This, what? There's so many scenes like this where it's just some random mentioning of something that I cannot envision at all. And I'm sure it's because it's a screenplay. So they're going to act it out. There's going to be stage, like it's going to be staged. So it doesn't need to be in the script. And I accept that, except that this doesn't make, like I, it can't, how? How? You don't have to describe it to me visually if you don't want to, but at least give me some background here. Why is this sink this way? Anyway, through the sink, uh, Albus and, and Scorpius end up in the lake and they find Cedric in the second task and perform an engorgement charm. And that's how Cedric is humiliated. I do take issue with this scene as well because one earlier in the uh, screenplay, Albus is practicing Expelliarmus with Delphi right before they go back to the first task because he is so bad at spell work apparently that he still hasn't learned 
how to do this spell well, even in his fourth year. So Delphi has to train with him and has to teach him how to do it well. So he's really bad. I mean, he even says, I'm really bad with my spell work. And yet Harry couldn't perform magic underwater because when he tried to speak, he would just have a bubble come out of his mouth and it would be nothing. He couldn't perform magic underwater during the second task in the fourth book. The only way the kids could have performed magic is if they did nonverbal spells, which in Harry's day wasn't taught until seventh year. So you'll have me believe that not only did they change the curricula curriculum so that nonverbal spells are now taught before fourth, fourth year, because they didn't even get to fourth year, they have three years of training. So nonverbal spells are now taught all the way back in third year, but also this kid who hasn't even learned to master Expelliarmus can perform a nonverbal engorgement spell? I don't buy it. Oh yeah, we also, I guess I should have talked about this earlier because this happens right away in the books, but we also need to talk about Harry's scar. It is somehow hurting him. Once again, not only has Rowling addressed this repeatedly since the books were finished and said that she's not, that Harry's scar doesn't still hurt after the seventh book because the reason his scar was hurting him was because he had the Horcrux inside of him so their souls were connected and so he could feel extreme feelings that Voldy was feeling. That was his connection to Voldy. Not only has she said that this is not a thing in Harry's life anymore, but it also also just doesn't make sense within the canon of the world, but also Delphi shouldn't affect that at all. Harry was affected by this because of Voldemort. Some relative of Voldemort shouldn't affect Harry's scar, even if it doesn't have to do with the Horcrux that is no longer inside of him. It still shouldn't some random person that has some of his blood. It doesn't make sense. Anyway, in this new timeline, again, where now Voldy rules and um, Muggleborns are being tortured inside of Hogwarts and Scorpius is supremely popular and it's just a grand old time. Everybody loves, oh yeah, Umbridge is headmaster for because, just because, not only is everybody saying Voldy's name outright, which all throughout the first seven books, you don't do. And if anybody did say his name, Bellatrix would lose her mind. You dare to speak the Dark Lord's name? Everybody was either terrified of his name or if they were his loyal follower, they would say either the Dark Lord or Lord Voldemort. And very few people even said that. It was pretty much just the Dark Lord. But in this timeline, everybody says it super casually. It's totally fine. We don't need to respect him now that he's our supreme ruler. Foldy's good. Nobody needs to say the Dark Lord. Oh, and Draco is still married to the to the same woman, which no, I reject. In this timeline where Voldy rules and Draco is now a big person in the ministry and he is still a servant of Voldy. He may not be a Death Eater anymore, that was unclear, but he still is obviously in Voldy's support. Otherwise, you know, he wouldn't be in a position of power. He's still married to the same woman and and Draco says that his dad, Lucius, never liked who Draco married because she was a muggle sympathizer. She wasn't a Death Eater. She liked muggles. I don't believe you that Draco, in a position of power and still a servant of Voldy, it would be fine that he was with a blood traitor. Also in the third timeline, we do get to meet up with Snape, which I've already talked about. I do not like this portrayal of Snape. I think that it is a very reductive version of him and I think that he deserves better than to be treated as such an unnuanced person. And while I do think that the scene of seeing Hermione as a rebel who's fighting against the cause and who's in hiding and she's chased after and her and Ron are fighting together, seeing her and Ron sacrifice themselves, even though their reasoning for not using the Patronus in order to give them more time doesn't make any sense at all. Sacrificing themselves and then Snape sacrificing himself as well so that Albus can get to the lake so that he can set back time once again. All of that was a really cool scene and I'm sure it looks great when played out, but I still don't like it because I don't think any of it, first of all, it, I don't see why nobody used the Patronus. They said, we don't wanna chase the Dementors that way, but just use the Patronus so that they're chased the other way. I don't, it doesn't really work and I don't like the character work for the third timeline, so. I wanna like it, but I don't. But also this whole thing with Snape's timeline doesn't work because Snape would still be dead. If Cedric did turn evil and then kill Neville and then they weren't able to um, kill Nagini, therefore not breaking the last Horcrux and now Voldemort rules, if all that were true, Voldy would have still killed 
Snape because he killed Snape before he even tried to kill Harry, before Neville would have killed Nagini. He killed Snape because he wanted power of the Elder Wand. Nothing would have changed. That would have still happened. That part of the timeline wouldn't have been different. So Voldy still would have killed Snape to get control of the Elder Wand, then go to kill Harry. Neville would have not killed Nagini, Voldy would have won, probably. I guess he would have just killed Harry twice. So Snape shouldn't even exist. Even in this timeline, Snape should still be dead. I also think it's funny how when Scorpius is trying to set back time, that's just totally brushed over. We don't even see it happen. Snape sacrifices himself. Scorpius gets back into the water so that he can go back and somehow fix what happened, right? So the boys perform the engorgement charm underwater. And so now Scorpius needs to go back to that and intervene just like they did with the first timeline that they messed up, or rather the first time they messed up the timeline and they had to go back and fix that, right? So Scorpius needs to do that too. He needs to somehow hinder himself from performing the engorgement charm so that Albus doesn't disappear and all, you know, all, you know what I'm saying? This timeline doesn't happen, right? But we don't see it happen. He jumps into the lake. Well, Severus, sacrifices himself, Scorpius jumps into the lake, and then Albus pops out of the lake. We don't see Scorpius go back in time. We don't see him do anything to prevent anything. He's just like, oh, okay, we're here now. It's fixed now. We don't know how or why, it just is. Now the last bit of this screenplay is probably the messiest bit of all. So I'm just gonna rush through it to get to the part that I really wanna talk about. Albus calls Delphi because he has a crush on her. She shows up, she says, hey, I'm gonna go back to the third task and make sure that everything, I'm, you know. So Delphi decides to take the kids back to the third task so that they can fulfill the prophecy, which, okay, why not? There's another prophecy. And they have to be the ones that stop Cedric. So they go back to the third task. Delphi flies over the maze and nobody sees her for some reason. Then for some reason, the way the time turner works changes. And now instead of after five minutes, all the kids go back to their original time or go back to the timeline that they were just in, now, for some reason, Delphi uses the time turner to go back to Godric's Hollow when Voldy was supposed to kill Harry in the first place without any of them going back to the other timeline. So she goes back to Godric's Hollow. The kids grab a hold of the time turner so they can go back with her. And now they're all stuck in this timeline because Delphi crushed the time turner. So now it's not gonna send them back to another timeline and they're all stuck here. And then just so many things. First of all, the boys are able to see where um, the Potters live before Voldy comes and get them, gets them, which doesn't work <laughs> because of the Fidelius charm. The Fidelius charm is what's protecting them. The Fidelius charm is why they were able to say, stay safe until Pettigrew sold them out. And even if they already knew where the Potters lived, and even if they already went and saw the ruins of the house at some point in their life before they started messing with time, even if all that's true, it doesn't matter. In this, in this time, the Fidelius charm is in effect. So even if they know exactly where to go, they still wouldn't be able to see the Potter's house because the Fidelius charm would protect the house from that. So they would just see ruins or they would just see like buildings against each other. They wouldn't actually be able to see inside the window of the Potter's house without Pettigrew himself telling them where to look, but they can. They can see it. Lily goes out of the house and decides to take Harry for a walk, even though they're in hiding and there's a reason they're under the Fidelius charm. She's just decided I'm going to leave and leave myself and my child vulnerable. She doesn't even go under the invisibility cloak, which like, why are you even in hiding if you're gonna do stupid stuff like that? And then the boys decide that they're gonna do this blanket trick where they're going to burn, they're gonna write a message on the blanket and then, and then it's gonna be burned because of the love potion and then Harry will see the message and hurrah all is well. But here's the problem. Lily's on a walk with Harry. Do the boys go up to Lily and say, hi, please don't look at us because we're a part of your future. But also, can we borrow that baby blanket, write some chemicals on it and then give it back to you? Is that how they got a hold of the baby blanket? Did they barge into the Potter's house at some point when all the Potters were home after Lily came back from her walk? and she now has the blanket in the house. Did they barge into the home and steal the blanket, even though the home is under the Fidelius charm? How did they get a hold of this blanket? I don't believe that they randomly just acquired this baby blanket and then gave it back to the baby and no one was the wiser. 
but they did. And because of a chain of very specific events, the message was seen and now Harry knows, I got a time travel to get to my kid. But oh no, all the time turners were smashed except for this one convenient one that makes this plot happen. How will I ever get to my child? I'll tell you how plot conveniences. Draco happens to have the one other time turner that's left in this world. So everybody decides that somebody has to impersonate Voldy so that they can face off against Delphi. They decide that it must be Harry and so they're going to transform him to look like Voldy. But apparently in this book, in this screenplay, transforming someone doesn't just mean changing their appearance like it has in the original books. Instead, this time it also somehow means that you might turn into that person. So everybody's afraid that Harry's gonna turn into Voldy if he looks like Voldy for a little while. I don't understand why, and it's not explained why. So Harry and, or Voldy, Harry Voldy and Delphi have a nice little chat where Delphi says, I'm your daughter from another timeline. Don't go kill Harry, and then you will rule, and it'll be the best, best thing ever. We'll be mother and daughter, father and daughter, and live happily ever after. She explains to Harry Voldy that she is his daughter and she exists because Voldy and Bellatrix decided to have a baby. And they had this baby right before the battle at Hogwarts. What? Not only do I not believe that Voldy wanted a baby, because one, he was fighting for immortality, so there's no way that he just thought, oh, I'll have an heir just in case I die. No, he, he didn't believe that he was going to die. He didn't believe that he was going to die to the extent that he didn't even think he needed to check his horcruxes at first when he realized that, when he realized that they were hunting them down. And two, there's no way that this was a sentimental guy that was like, oh, I should have a kid so that I can be a dad someday. No, there's, I, no. Voldy did not just decide to have a kid. Also, the timeline doesn't work. Okay, let's talk about this. Bellatrix had the baby right before the Battle of Hogwarts. Cool. Awesome. I believe you. We saw Bellatrix right before the Battle of Hogwarts when she was torturing Hermione. She certainly wasn't pregnant then, so I guess she must have already had the baby at that point. Which was also the point where Draco was living in Malfoy Manor. You're gonna tell me that he never heard a baby cry? He never, while he was living there, he never saw Bellatrix be nine months pregnant one day and then none months pregnant the next day and then heard a baby crying in the upper room. You're gonna tell me that never happened? Because Draco did not know about Delphi's existence in The Cursed Child. And yet he lived in the same house with Delphi somehow without knowing. Also, not only that, but even if Bellatrix wasn't pregnant at the time that she was torturing Hermione, which she can't have been because people would have noticed a nine month belly there. So that means that she would have been properly pregnant at the beginning of book seven, where they're in the air and chasing down the seven Harrys while they're transporting Harry to the burrow. But ain't nobody noticed her pregnant at that point either. I just, I don't believe you. Then Delphi realizes that she's been duped, so she seals off all the doors in the room, and now Harry needs to fight off Delphi, except that Hermione, I think it is, shouts, Harry, all the doors are locked. We can't get out. So Harry faces off against Delphi for like a second and then Albus hops in and he alohomoros all the doors so that everybody can come out and fight Delphi. I'm sorry, does alohomora not work from the other side of the door? Is there a reason that none of the adults thought of alohomora to get themselves out of the locked door if that's all it took? I don't believe you. Then you have just like a million little inconsistencies that don't, that aren't really that big and don't matter that much, but it's just like, they don't, They didn't need to be there. Like Harry saying that he's never told anyone that the Sorting Hat wanted to put him in Slytherin, which flatly isn't true. He told a couple, he never wanted to tell people. It was an. It was information that he guarded and he was ashamed of, but he did tell a couple people throughout the series. Polyjuice Potion for some reason is tremendously painful now. It hurts like crazy when they take it and causes a ton of burping, which, what? Expelliarmus some, somehow is a summoning charm now. Throughout the series, when you pronounce, when you when you perform Expelliarmus, it will cause the wand, it will disarm them, it'll cause the wand to go flying away. And sometimes the characters catch the wand and sometimes they don't. Sometimes it just goes off in a direction and you have to go find it. But for some reason in this book, it's a summoning charm. Oh, and I hated the way Dumbledore's portrait was handled in this, in this screenplay. In book seven of the Harry Potter series, Dumbledore's portrait is actively involved. After Dumbledore dies, Snape still doesn't know Dumbledore's full plan and Dumbledore's portrait, we see this in Snape's memories, Dumbledore's portrait is still giving Snape information and instructions and telling him what to do. In this book, the portrait is just like this 
senile memory of a man that is barely comprehensive. And even McGonagall says, listen, Dumbledore is only there, the old headmasters are only there as a support to the new headmasters. It's not actually, it's not really them. I can't take instruction from him. Excuse me, what? Snape did. There's actually quite a few more little things like those that just don't add up, but honestly, I'm tired of talking about it. I get that this is a screenplay, and I do think that if I watched it act out, I would maybe give it like a two stars or maybe even a three, just because I bet the performance brings a lot of this to life a lot better, but it can't, it can't undo the gaping plot holes and inconsistencies in the original, in the original stories. And that's honestly really frustrating because even though this was written by not JK Rowling, it was conceptualized with her and she did put her stamp of approval on it and said, yeah, go with it. And she even said this should be treated as canon. And honestly, it's really frustrating that Rowling has this little respect for her readers that she thinks that we wouldn't notice or care that this doesn't resemble her story at all. I went into this thinking, ah, it'll be a quick, fun hate read. I'll have a good time doing it. We'll all talk about how bad it is. It'll be a great time. But actually I hated reading this. It was so frustrating, especially freshly coming out of my reread of the entire series because I love this series so much. And this book didn't do justice to so many of the characters or the world or the magic or the story itself. It was mostly just frustrating. I've about lost my voice because I've been filming for so long today. So be sure to chat with me more about this screenplay in the comments. Let me know your thoughts. Let me know if there were some things that I missed talking about that you wanna talk about. I post videos every Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. I'll see you guys again soon.